realize and visualize the infinity of the universe. Well, he's under construction. This makes it much better recording. Yeah. So the, the, the pig says to the lama, teach me how to find tranquility, inner tranquility. So he, the lama says, assume the yoga posture. And then close your eyes and try to visualize the universe and the infinity of the universe. Well, he picks up down and closes his eyes, and after a while, he says, how are you doing? He says, well, I'm only, s all is happening, I, I'm not getting any, any tranquility, he says, uh, after getting the instructions, this was the, the remark the pig made. Is that all I got to do, you know? If I sit down, close my eyes, is that this what I have to do to, is that how I get this tranquility? Shut my eyes and visualize, huh? So the Lama says, yes. So how are you doing, you know? I ain't seen anything. Uh, all I can think of is New Year's Eve. <laughs> or parties, that's all the pig can see in his mind. So the Lama picked up a mallet and hit him in the head <laughs> and knocked him out cold. When he hit him on the head, he saw all the stars in the universe, <laughs> and he saw all the lights in the universe, and then the Lama says, some people are hard to tranquilize inside. <laughs> Somebody got hit him hard in the head. <laughs> That's a very true thing. Uh, with most of us, when we start meditating, the, the mind. This is normal. It's nothing new. Yeah, but you know, so many times it happens that we, I mean, people who say, uh, well, I'm resigned to God's will, and then uh, we end up doing things which, uh, I mean, under that law sometimes, that it's God will I'm doing, and uh, Oh, yeah. How is that? Right. Well, you see, it's not, for instance, I said Divine Mother willing, this is the thing, not my will, because I, I can't come back my own. So. Now, I meditate, but I never ask Divine Mother where I should go, what I should do, because the first thing the scriptures of all religions <laughs> point out, do not pray like the Gentiles, like the gentle folk, mm. those who have no understanding. Sure. You see? No. The, the, the uninformed, do not pray like the uninformed who is praying for things. Now, learn to pray by seeking first the kingdom of God which is within you, and all these things will be added unto you. That is, try to sit down and gather in meditational practice. Oh, thank you. And gather in this eye, this consciousness, and let it calm you down. get in the meditative life, 
we're trying to to feel ourselves through the the actions around us, through the things that are synchronizing our our life. We are. Uh, it says, well, this is God's will or my will. Which is which? God's will. is so well organized that when the experience comes along and you get involved, the information that is being brought out, you see why it is God will that you have to be there at that particular time for that particular experience. Otherwise, it is not there. And the scripture says, your needs are fulfilled, not the wants. And this is a lesson we got to learn to live with. This is something we have to learn to live. This is a natural process. As we learn to live with the need, then that doesn't say we don't develop our abilities. That doesn't say we mustn't develop our artistic nature, our talents, because this is a, this is a evolution. We have to gather this consciousness and work with it. But meditation is to help you to go to these things with a better sense of attitude, a, a different frame of mind, not as a, a, a sort of a defeatist attitude. Always think, if you're fortunate to be the one little sperm that became a human being, you're going to be fortunate enough to make the grade with what you attempt to do. Because this is already implanted in the sperm, in the very genes, for success. Now, if you defeat that, then you're destroying the very life principle in yourself. That's why the Master says the worst thing for a spiritual person is doubt. They, they condemn, they wouldn't condemn any other behavior pattern in a person. But the one particular thing that they have tremendous, they don't want to see it in a person, is a sense of doubt. If you don't believe, all right, but don't doubt. They barely say, I don't believe, but don't doubt, you see. Don't doubt that you can, that, that these things can happen. Better say, I don't believe in it. But to say, I doubt these things do exist, you know, then doubt already sets up a, uh, a sort of defeated attitude in the individual. Um, I, also, I, this, this building of faith, I mean, it, it should be not only don't have doubt, but continue to build up a stronger and stronger Thank belief you. or a faith in, in the, um, um, the inheritance you call beingness of your nature or of God. Um, because it is in the measure of your faith that anything is done unto you. Or that anything is that happens. Well you see, in this way how you you increase your your successive abilities. Or what you say the spiritual forces that want you to be at the right place for the right experience is by re recognizing the actual fact of success by becoming a human being. If you do not recognize this fact, this physical fact of having succeeded to become a human being, then this, this sense of success don't exist for you. The sense of failure exists for you. You see? The Jewish people are very, very success-minded, but their sense of success because there's, they have accepted the fact that they have achieved human birth. They have achieved, they will overcome. And in yoga, this is the first thing, Martin Luther's banner talk, you know, he will overcome. But he's not saying he's overcome because he knew that he succeeded in being a, to become a human being from the sperm. The yogis know this. Therefore, there is no impossible thing for a spiritual master. He doesn't, he bases his power to overcome karma or the laws of nature where other men fail. He bases it on the actual fact that he became a human being over all the teeming masses that were struggling to get to that over. He was the one, he was the one that made it. So the one that made it is the one that has a sense of strength. Nos ni kam fajtit, kas tādi. 
Right. Yeah. Because the path is this, life mm -hmm. and death, and life and accomplishment of becoming human form, taking on human form and working with as a God principle. Look how many are discarded. And if you look at through a microscope, yeah. and you see. Mm -hmm. So the one that did succeed is, is the one that is, a, is what you say, chosen. No, Brahma, Brahma has chosen. No, Abraham says, I have chosen these people. These are the chosen people of God. All right, look at it in a different context. The, the creative intelligence has chosen to intercede for the one sperm to succeed. So they say in the scriptures, happy is the man who has gained human birth, for it is the will of God and his grace that made it possible. Well, we don't understand how that, uh, we read it as poetry, now let us read it as objective science and as religion, and see how it is true. The sperm was the thing that did it. The motility of that, the action, that drive, that will, the Peter, then the John, the devotion of having come out now as human form to realize yourself. You see the symbols are they ready? Bring out the, the nature of you. You realize now why you have to succeed, why you do succeed. In spite of yourself, you want to succeed. <laughs> In other words... You've already succeeded. <laughs> well, once you have been bitten by the bug of success or accomplishment, this, this sense of accomplishment, but when you defeat it by feeling that you're not succeeding, then you are weakening the thing. You are weakening this principle.
Well, we also have this to recognize the worthiness of every other person. Right. I think I'm getting bored. Now you understand what they say, to love neighbor as self? You cannot love neighbor as self in the true sense of the word unless you accept the worthiness of self. Where is the worthiness of self? If you constantly defeat yourself of being worthy of being a being, of being a channel or an expression of God, then you have defeated your neighbor too. Okay? You first got to evaluate your own worth. You got to evaluate your own worth, that you are worthy to have the grace of light to, to descend and make you succeed at this critical point of, of truth which is a sperm into human form, into God form. Well, when you say succeed, um, what are you trying to succeed at? Um, what are you trying to be worthy of other than... God seeks within himself to achieve the full realization or express himself as full realization in human form. That's why he, he slowed down our created human form, in order to worship himself. And so, he himself, this created intelligence, seeks to establish worthiness of his own self in form. Otherwise, what, is, what, are, what do we need a form? What does God need a form to worship with himself? The form will never admit to itself that it's, it is worthy of the divine intervention. Its ego will say, I am more important, but that's not worthiness. I am more superior, but that's not worthiness. The ego can be very puffed up, but the ego talking is self-pride. That's not worthiness. Yeah. You understand? Worthiness is a humility with not a sense of defeatism. There's no sense of being defeated when you think you're worthy of something or you're entitled to something. It is a, a sense of strength that permits you to apply yourself without any sense of doubt or backsliding. Well, it's a complete realization of, of who you are, uh, what you know that you are, um, say, God in, in manifestation. Um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that God was not worthy of succeeding. Mm -hmm. So you have to admit that you are. Right? Okay. You ask, how much is this worth? So we say maybe 10 cents, 15 cents. We don't say it's, it doesn't worth anything. It worth something. Right? Now, in human consciousness and in beingness, we are worth something too. No, we got to establish what is it something we are worth. Now, the the more complicated, the more better material this object is made from, the greater is the worth. Now, in, in consciousness, is the same thing. We place a higher worth or sense of value on the realized master's presence than on the person who is not realized. Don't we do that? Now, if two people came come to work for you, don't you put a higher sense of value on the more experienced individual than the less one? Why? Because it's the application of one to the other, the involvement of responsibility of one to the other. It's like the three men had three talents given to them, one had five, one or two, or whatever it is, 
and they all went out and applied. Well, what did the third one do with his? Yeah, he hid it. He hid it. So what, what, what was it worth to him then? Was there any worthiness in him? If he himself don't consider himself worthy enough to apply himself, the, the, the being who gave him or the person who gave him something, isn't it right for him to take it back from him? <laughs> You're wasting the thing. In other words, whatever you are worth and whatever you estimate yourself on, the highest estimate you place on yourself is soul. You see? If you place yourself the highest estimate, it's not ego, no, that you are soul, then you're going to realize it in this life form. You, the effort is not wasted. The effort is going to come more now. You're going to see it because every action that you perform now is will of God. Guru, through the Guru, from the contact with Gurus, you are doing their will, which is you are meditating to discover yourself. You are accepting the challenge. <coughs> now that doesn't say if somebody is sick you don't pray for them, but what is the will of God too in that person's life? The will of God is that man should lift himself up. But that man's karma may prevent him from lifting himself up or prevent you know, him. This, this brings up a question in my mind, um, Adam, and that is, um, uh, of course, it was brought on by this thing that uh, we read that, um, in the book that um, Louise had over here the other night when Krishnamurti said something about um, people who go out, who go around trying to help are a curse. Um, sometimes I wonder if we don't seemingly interfere in trying to help another because the very thing that he has is, is really a result of his own actions, thought, or his own being misfiring somewhere. And how else can he learn except through the, uh, through the, uh, the discomfort that's brought on through that? If you if you take away the the thing uh, uh, that is giving him this discomfort, if you take it away too easily, will he ever uh, begin to think in terms of what the cause is, or who he is, or um, what might have brought this on? I don't know whether I make myself clear or not, but. Uh, It isn't that you don't want to be helpful to people, but in taking that problem away from them, have you really helped them? Sometimes the greatest help is not to help. Well, that's what I wondered. And this is what they call the saints sometimes they appear to be cold potatoes. Yeah. But they are not cold potatoes in the sense that they don't give no physical, tangible expression of help to satisfy the the five senses or the ego, but they do help by re-evaluating themselves within you as themselves. They try to see themselves in you. Now when I look at you, I'm trying to see a dino, or my consciousness, I'm trying to see the, the consciousness of God. What is the God in, uh, in uh, mortal? It's the life power which is in me. Can I recognize this life, how it vibrates, how it scintillates, how it is, text, and so on. What is commun coming out from it? Which is self. Because this self is the audible life current. You see? Now, to say to you, do this, do that, this is only a mechanical action. It's like saying to myself, I should do this, I should do that. That's a mechanical action. But if I don't say anything, when I try to picture you in totalness, which is picturing myself in totalness too, then in totalness or in, in, in oneness, I see myself as harmony. Then sooner or later, your mechanism starts to take on the sense of harmony. And where there's harmony, there isn't going to be illness or right. anything else, because that is the outpicture right. of illness. Then, but then after you reap this harp, harvest of harmony in yourself, you've got to share it. 
You gotta share it because you can't use it all yourself. But yeah, but how do you share it? Only when you get to a certain degree of uh, development or realization that you share this, you can pray for them, meditate for them, and turn the thing over to the masters. Well, that's what I can you know, say. You don't deliberately go out and interfere in their life. Or, no, but then you see the masters you also give care. you some of the workload to carry to you. You got to carry some of the workload. But you don't force you into it right away. See, for instance, there was a, a, a king who was ill, son was ill, and he prayed that the illness go to him. And his son became well. That's a workload. And that's how they work out. Many masters work out the calm of friends or disciples and their bodies. Okay. Yes, but, uh, this also true that when we say that I am helping you, you sort of ignore the duality, you feel different from me. Mm-hmm. To say to somebody, I'm helping you, this is duality too. It's a duality because you're, you're not helping. You, you, what you really, <coughs> by not saying anything, by saying I'll think of it or I'll meditate upon it, I'll pray on it. Now if you, we have three ways to pray in which we can confuse ourselves. One, we pray that the person get well. But we are confused to the extent that they need to be well. Because, and, and we are confused to the extent that we think all prayers are so important that the divine intelligence has got to intercede to make them well. <laughs> you see the, 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 the pride and the ego that kept in there? <laughs> right away, because we assume right away that all prayers are so important to create an issue in the, or intercede in that person's life. Now, this is a, this is a thing now. If you, that's one approach that we have, that this is a weakness too. How do we stop, step, 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 uh, step aside from that weakness? We meditate again in ourselves. And we have to, what we have to pass through that to recognize it, and we have to expose it, otherwise we, we don't know that we've done that. We don't know we, we were victims of doing such a thing. We all have done it. Everyone has done it. That thing that but it is the actual experiencing that thing, though, that makes you wise enough to know or realize what it is. Right, because after you've prayed many times that way, and you see the repercussions of having think you have helped, and then you really didn't help, then you, you take stock of yourself. Do I really help, or should I help? Or who helped? Or what is being helped? If God has slowed down and become this person, and this person has a malfunction of thinking and is reaping the rewards of the malfunction of thinking and turns to you and you with a, and I or we with both puffed up egos assume that this is gonna our so called spirituality is gonna correct this thing. We are big fools. We really really ain't doing anything. You understand? We are we're deluding ourselves. The thing is to say to the person after we realize what is being involved I will meditate on it. But don't say, I can try and heal you. Or I'm going to ask God to heal you. You understand? Because then again, you, you think you have some kind of pull with this unseen force, which he doesn't think he has a pull. You understand? And then, then right away, he, he develops a sense of inferiority complex, and you develop the inferiority, the artist superiority complex. Which is the same thing. Same thing. thing. Now, if you say you'll meditate, you'll try to, to see within yourself the, the truth of the thing, here I am, a self, pure energy. And that other person is pure energy. That other person is, is light, is consciousness. And two things equal to the same thing are themselves equal to one another. Then how is it going to be possible for you not to love one another? If that is consciousness and that is light and that is energy, and your consciousness, you, and they are both equal, you see the equality of the thing now? Both being equal and the same thing. But now, then, if you feel harmony, then you don't pray for harmony in that person. You harmonize consciousness with consciousness. You know in your consciousness that that person is functioning now. 
in harmony and in consciousness because that person is consciousness and that person is of the same nature, the same substance, the same thing. So you're not interfering no more. You're not taking part or, or, or dictating. You are now synchronizing. You're maintaining a continuous thought of duality. Uh, you, you're you synchronizing. You it, it's a sense of synchronization now. It's an acknowledgement with the thing. So that's why the, the centurion, when he came to Jesus, all of a sudden he realized, why should I invite this man? Why should I ask him to pray for my son? If you only say the word, you see? But if saying the word was something tangible he needed to clear up in his mind the sense of oneness. And Jesus, seeing that, said, Never in this whole land have I seen such faith. But go. It's all right. It's done. What is done? Did Jesus do something? Or it is done because the man has come to the realization that there is a oneness between him and all life, that his son is still himself, and he's the progenitor of his son, and all the, the whole. He sees it now. He sees the connecting link of all things with the mere fact that he he stopped asking the man to come to the house. You know, that he woke up to the realization that the whole thing was oneness. This this has, is taking place within the man finally. And because it's taking place within him finally, from that deeper realm of, of his nature, Jesus is affirming it. Jesus is sort of a play, uh, putting a sort of a, a sense of a confirmation to this, that uh, understanding. It's done. It's done unto you that who realize now that the whole thing is a total oneness. That is yourself who is being healed in the child. It is your real self. You only see him as a child because you, you, you were the father from a physical standpoint. Now you are seeing it not as a father because you stop wanting to invite me into the house as a physical being. You stop the, the, the process of, of delusion. You see? The mental block. You, you automatically recognize the mental block that this is not a child no more. This is self. And I am not a teacher coming now to, to be coming to the house to heal this man. This is self again talking. The, the, the man got an illumination, an enlightenment to self. The moment he recognized that he didn't have to go and ask the man to come in now. You know, when he says, when he met him, he says, my son, yeah, and Jesus will say, well, I don't go heal people who don't belong to his, his church, you know, or his nationality. But... He says, if you only say the words, sir. But this is the enlightenment now. It's an enlightenment to oneness in self. And well, this, is the, this, this is also the enlightenment of the, of when you say, when you come into this realization that I am so, not that I have one, but that I am so, and being so, I am one with the soul nature of the universe. Yes. Now, feeling it, the, the thing is this, you have to feel. Yeah. See, once you start feeling, there is a pulling back from all the five senses, all through the nerves, from the leg, ears, and there's a sense of pulling, the energy seems to pull back and stops in certain portion of your body. It stops right there, on the top of the skull and in the forehead. And you feel a sense of, like it's numb. In other words, all the energies have returned back to a, s a fulcrum, a, f a firing point. You understand? Know Which is the real you. When you close your eyes, you are pulling back in, into yourself. You are pulling back into the core of yourself. Now, the real core of yourself is, is not triggering off anything. The real core of yourself is devotion, which is the, 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 the natural love, the natural love of being yourself, the natural love of sitting right where you are and being content. Now, this doesn't say that you sit down there and have no compassion or anything, not get involved in worldly activities. Yogteshwar just knocked that out of Yogananda's head. 
Don't get drunk in this core of identity. Don't get drunk in this blissful feeling without partaking in material activity because it's a world that is built that way. Only people who are made out of marble don't act. <laughs> Only made out of flesh. We have to act. You see? But to act out that realization in all of living. Well, the thing is, it is not r running away or sitting down that solves the problem. It's getting inside first and feeling the strength from inside in order to go outside with it. This is something that is different. It is something that you, you t it takes a while to adjust to. Well, it, it, you'd have to experience it little by little, I think. To yes. Realize it. Uh, Peace don't come like something <laughs> and you suddenly transform. It is a gradual saturation of your cells. You know, the yogi or the spiritual man in this early part of his life or the very start of his meditative life begins to feel the presence of God or the divine spiritual force as a pressure around the neck and the head and the forehead and the temples like a sight of pulsating. This is to give him indication or to make him aware of the fact that he is linked up now with the divine principles of his nature and that he should be more aware and try not to break that link, not try to uh, disturb the link, try to understand how it functions and try to live with it. Now, Yogananda says, gradually, as you learn to live with this vibration or this presence, you begin to do your daily duties with a sense of inner calmness. That's why the meditation is no good just to sit down and close the eyes and feel a little bliss. It is The best of it is to open the eyes and to try to take it. That's why they say, open your eyes, don't move, and try to hold on to this inner synchronization or this inner synchronized peace, this inner contemplative condition, this inner softness, this inner strength and walk out in the material realm or objective realm, taking it in stride. Now, you apply yourself in art, music, anything. When, when you apply yourself, you apply yourself from that frame of reference, from that particular sense of attitude, that you are calm, collective, and you have deeper. Now, actors and actresses, are forced more than normal people to react faster under those conditions. It takes a great deal of mental conditioning to shift from one emotional nature to another, let alone if you can have the devotional nature. You see, imagine uh, Jerry Lewis playing a, a Roman priest. He's going to be a comedian priest. But then if you can take on the serious nature, still it's gesture, mood and gesture, attitude again. See. The whole thing is still, the person has to condition himself and go in, he has to live the part. Now this is the thing, as I say, the living Bible is one little expression to live the part of the actual thing. A spiritual person is no different than any other person. Only he, the idea was there and 99% of it is perspiration. You see, the <coughs> more and more as you get into yourself, There are three distinct things that take place. One, the calmness, the tenderness,
and the invisible strength of conviction. This is something you begin to realize sooner or later over the years of meditative life. When you say strength, um, is that uh, strength to fulfill the strength of will? Um, um no, not strength of will. Strength of acceptance. <coughs> you accept yourself not strength to dominate or push out another. You are here. You are you. In other words, each one of us is a unique petal in the flower. Now, you know, the peculiar thing is this. The petal in the flower is connected to the next petal. You ever look at the flower before the, the, the petals separate? Hmm? I don't think so. The, the, before the, 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 when the bud is closed up, you go to open it. Before you start tearing petal off from petal, there's a slight connecting link from one to the other. From one petal to the other? Yeah. There is a, a connection. That connection is the unity of our life frequency in all of us. We are all connected equally within to God. The sense of identity is the individual settlement is pulled apart by the pressure of the air to express its own identity. And this is what we are when we seem to want to communicate our nature to others. It gives us a, a sense of identity. The moment you want to communicate to me, you disconnect from everything that you are connected to and you project you. But if you don't want to communicate to me, then you are connected back to everything and everything around you at once. You feel your sense of oneness now in a room. Try to communicate now. You have to disconnect. Well, it's almost imperceptible, but you... That is so minute. Takes place. And yet it is happening in us. And through the meditation, this is what makes us realize now that love is not to be in love or to be loved or to crave love. Love is this connecting link, this minute principle that holds us together, that you can now feel yourself. And as you feel yourself <coughs> one with it, now when you try to communicate, you do not step away from the oneness of it. You see, before you try to communicate, you have to disconnect yourself to communicate. But in the pure love, there is no disconnection to communicate to no one. The love is. You see? You were, it, it, it's going to the thing. Uh, mentioning uh, something earlier in the evening about having... Um, my brain's kind of fuzzy right now. About the mallet here. Yeah, that mallet here. What was that? You have the same picture. Yeah, I remember. Kate has colored it and it looks marvelous. The one that she colored for me. It looks beautiful in color. The pink pig. Yeah, nice llama, you know, he's all dressed up in his you know, and he's sitting down there, and I tell you, that's whacking his head, and he's just whining out. <laughs> it, it is interesting to see, because
because it is describes many things about us in meditation, what we are actually doing in meditation. It, the fellow who wrote it had to experience meditation, all the, the thing that went through in meditation. I'll tell you a little story. There is a friend of mine. She is a study with Paramsi Yogananda. <laughs> and after the master passed away, you know, after the master passed away, she uh, came out from the ashram to live outside on her own. She was really developed. And she wanted to attend um, a Zen Buddhist meditation. Well, she went to the meditation that night with her daughter. And they are all sitting down meditating. And the master walks around and he has all of a sudden he takes his fist and gives a whack in the head and tell her to get up. <laughs> that was the end of the meditation. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> That was the end of the <laughs> She said to me, a banner, I saw stars, planets, lights and colors, everything. Uh, she said, well, have you gone back? She said, oh, not for that type of meditation. <laughs> but her daughter told her, I said, well, this is what you were asking for. You were asking to see the inner lights. <laughs> <laughs> and where, uh, where are the inner lights? Out of tissue, bone, is congealed energy, light, and it's uh, not going to release itself by except by a shock. Now, tremendous concentration takes a while for this thing to give up its electrical vibration. Yet if you put your fingers over the eyes like this, you begin to see the entire infinity, the whole universe, like if you went to 2001 to see the picture. The whole thing is right there. But this takes pressure. Now she wasn't willing to do all that. So he took his fist and he gave her a whack in her head. And she saw it. And he said, that's this shows the end of our meditation. <laughs> the thing is, the meditation is trying to make you watch inside and collect these energies to the central part of your being in order for your mind to be Clear vision, seer, you know, the clear point. Can you can you force that through will? Or I mean, uh, there is no forcing. There is no will. Uh, there this is strictly uh, we call it. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, um, but there is uh, the to time. be concentrated. <coughs> yeah. You know, thinking is one of the hardest things to think, this uh, to feel and watch. This is vigil. It's a vigil to stay there and watch for a long time to see us in a light. And now don't count it in terms of overnight activity because this thing can take months, years. This is a growing thing because the tissues are alive, they're growing. So it takes a while for it to get up. But then all during that period there is a sense of joy. This is the important thing. Now you can see all the lights. I hear all the wondrous songs. But if you don't have the joy, you have nothing. You cannot take away the joy from inside, you know. Now, Master used to say, if heaven is a place where we are going to go to be joyful, and you never experience one bit of it in the physical body while you're on this earth, so what good did God give you a body for? What did you want to ask you yeah, for a body? To, if you don't, you can't experience it here, and you were in the realm of joy, 
we are joy, you know. <laughs> the angels are supposed to be joyful, and yet they, they are envious of you if you got a body. So, uh, the, is their joy real to them? Are they really experiencing the joy that they are talking about? The joy you are talking about is the fact that you can feel it in these tissues. That it can come out and, and, and be con- you can consciously experience a, a flow of this light. To be conscious of this thing. Now, unconscious joy is sleep. You know, but you uh, need to argue about one day. We all have that every day. <laughs> you know, the scientist says, what portion of our life we sleep it away? A great portion of it. That's unconscious joy. Now, in the spiritual life, that's joy, but still, you got no way to be conscious of it, to say that it's there inside. So when you're in the physical body, this joy is here in meditation, which is intuitive, and thus it's in the spiritual realm or cosmic realm. Yet, the great joy is this. With the eyes open, and action, the greater joy is here still. The active life is the greater joy. This is why they say Brahma, the creator, creates, Vishnu, the preserver, maintains. But the creator is joy is great. The preserver's joy is greater. But the greatest joy is the renovator, <coughs> the remodeler. The person who is tearing down and building up with a new expression, he's getting greater joy. He's getting the greatest joy. The greatest joy is always to set up something fresh, to reactivate it. You're to into the to re- ground now. Huh? <laughs> into the what? You're getting into the debatable ground now. <laughs> debatable ground? Yeah. Um, this begins to smack of that returned son, and I, I've always still had a feeling that the boy that stayed home and took care of things was just as deserving as the one that went out and lived a while and came back and was accepted. Mm. And I haven't quite been able to tell her that yet. Well, you see, that is a symbolism that the Master Jesus used, you see, the prodigal son. There are two lights in us. There is a wayward light that moves out through the five senses through either. And there is a stable light that stays within us called Pingala. It doesn't go nowhere. Either goes all the time. Now, therefore it goes down into what our, our basic nature down in the pig sty. It crawls in the pig sty. It becomes degenerate. It discharges. So it's like a prodigal child. That's why it's called a prodigal. The, the pull of the one light going this way. When that light reaches a point of total discharge, not complete though, total, that light sees it's too weak now because it's drained out. It's depending on the midbrain or the solar plexus to, to activate phenomena, to participate in phenomena to survive. Therefore, it comes to its senses. It comes to its senses. This is what he says. He came back to his senses. He came back to himself. It returns back here now, trying to find out why. Discontent has crept in. Disillusion has crept in. So it tries to go back. No. But on the return up now, the moment this sense of disillusion, this sense of recrimination, sense of making amends, a remodification begins in the human being, Intuition starts moving forward, not reason. It's the strangest thing. Reason don't come back, moving down to the person who wants to make amends. Intuition, devotional love starts moving out to the person who wants to make amends. Why? 
reason would interfere and prevent him from being humble. A person who wants to make amends starts to be humble. His nature becomes humble. He's trying to be honest with himself for the first time, and reason has no place there now. Reason would only destroy anything, and reason is finger luck uh, uh, coming back again, because the other one says to himself, why should I give up my words? <laughs> why should this coin now start taking and uh, pushing back this side now? Why does this other one got to come back in? Why did not why did not why, why did not intuition come down and help me here? And give me a chance to go further in, get past this thousand petal lotus. It doesn't. It, it moves forward when ping when idol starts pulling back. When the the degenerative energy starts pulling back, the disillusion starts remaking uh, remaking itself or making amends itself. The intuition starts coming down and reaching it out and encouraging it back. This is what we call the regenerative life. It begins to pull back now. It gives it encouragement. It re meets it, re uh, it meets it halfway. The intuitive nature becomes... It pulls it back for the first time. Is that what's going on? It is what you call going through RAM. This is exactly another way say you're going through the resistance, the adjustment, the mutations of consciousness and the molding or patterns of consciousness, and eventually you go through what is called saturation, lag, and then, or night of the soul, and then recurrence, that is, a new expansion of mind and soul, and force, and you make it. And you always expand a little more. Every time. You never go backwards in this process, because it's there, you see. Now, Masters have pointed out that you can use mantras or the gurus and some ho the holy names or the holy prophets, they are the ones can help you to go inside for the ring. That's why you should be able to meditate and call upon these holy ones to help you move inside. Well, now, don't think uh, for one moment they say move inside, you're going to fly away out of your mechanism and go flying all over the joint. Moving inside also is again, a process of clearing up in the mind ideas of behavior and understanding how this behavior can now transfer itself to outward action. Most of us have go into ourselves, we make decisions within ourselves, but we don't take it out into outward action. We don't see the peace in the outward action. There is no peace. So what have we got? Now, if the peace that passes all understanding is the thing that most of uh, the saints seem to bestow upon us, and when you meet the saint, what does he got to bestow? Does he bestow miracles? He's praying all the time. Well, if he's praying, he may be re repeating a mantra, or the name of God, or he may be immersed in the beatific feeling. So I must have busted your cord here. this inner refinement that is occurring inside of you. You see. Sadhana, you spoke of the master, the name of the master helping you in meditation to to come through or to, to understand. Is this actually something that is coming from the master? Is it is he in some way personally conscious of this falling upon him? Uh, one of the sailors or is it just a no, you see, no, you have a living master. 
I'm assuming this is a master who no, well, is not conscious of eating one. You see, the living master is one you have, uh, that, that you know is living in the body. That is working from the, 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 the realm of matter to matter, because you are matter. And Babaji is a living master. He's working from that realm to you in your meditative practices. Yukteswar and all these men have reached the resurrected body, but then you will always be in doubt as to where you stand in worthiness of a resurrected body to your physical body. Now, in terms of the human body, that's why the, the, the expression, the need of a living master, because form. But Babaji is in this form, Charan Singh and all these men, they're in the living form. They are linking you through the meditative process to the levels of consciousness within yourself. They are involved in this as a, a physical thing. Now, whenever you meet them, you know them, they, they show you themselves that they can take you to this level. They pull you to this level because they are still in the physical form. See? Now, John had to do this for Jesus. Jesus knew this as a reality. So, when you, you meditate, the name of the Master is a link. Now, let me show you another way of saying it. All right, you have a TV set in the room. There are so many channels to which you can turn to. You have to pre-select what channel you want to tune in on. And the program is coming and it's been picked up because of previous association. Now, you may not know what program is on tonight, but you're playing just that particular channel. In the case of the Living Masters, Sorry to cut this off, folks, but this will be continued on the other side. If you will turn the tape over, uh, I think I'm going to backtrack just a few words to give you the connection.